Well, good afternoon, everyone. Cynthia Tomain here with Interactive Brokers, and welcome to today's webinar on how to mine energy coils for trading futures and options in the bond and notes markets. Now, with us today, I'm very pleased to have Tim Morge, but before we get into Tim's presentation, uh, we also have Barbara Schmidt-Bailey, who's uh, with us from the CME. Now, Barbara's going to have a few words to say about uh, the products we'll be discussing today and where you can find some additional information. So, Barbara, if you can unmute your phone, let's get underway. Thanks for joining us, Barbara. Thanks, Cynthia, and thanks every, to everyone who's joined us for today's event. My name is Barbara Schmidt-Bailey with the CME Group, and we are very pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with Interactive Brokers. I am also particularly pleased to be able to welcome you to the presentation, How to Mine Energy Coils for Trading Opportunities in the Bond and Notes Market, with Tim Morge. As a trader and investor, you look for opportunity in the markets and a way to capture and profit from that opportunity. Futures are an extremely flexible tool for expressing your market opinion and capturing trading opportunity. Furthermore, there are several distinct benefits to futures, which uh, could be considered as you're looking for a trading vehicle, including uh, efficient capital usage, um, no difference between going long or short or any short selling restrictions, near around the clock electronic markets, and um, CME Group is part of a regulated industry under the US CFTC and NFA, um, which provides additional financial safeguards to the markets. Here just a, a slide to show that there are a large number of products traded at CME Group that span from very short-term short term 30-day Fed fund futures to our ultra bond 25 to 30 year uh, futures available all along the yield curve. What Tim is going to be focusing on today is the 10 year T note and what's called the classic T bond. Um, there are a very wide uh, group of participants in our interest rate markets, um, everyone from professional users to speculators um, who all are interested in. Um, having interest rate exposure and managing interest rate exposure risk among the most liquid products in the world and at CME Group. Uh, U.S. Treasury futures and options lend themselves to a variety of risk management and trading applications, including hedging, income enhancement, duration adjustments, interest rate speculation, and spread trades. The average daily volume in Treasury futures and options has been as high as 4.1 million contracts a day, with more than 90% of that traded electronically. For a further in-depth introdu introduction to the CME Group interest rate markets, please look for the archived recording from two weeks ago on Interactive Brokers' website with my colleague David Gibbs. As mentioned, today we'll be focusing on 10-year notes and 30-year Treasury bonds and his trading examples. Many of you are already familiar with Tim Morge and his work. A longtime trader and member of the exchange, Tim devotes much of his time now to teaching traders and running his educational website and service at marketgeometry.com. This presentation is part of a year-long series with Tim as he presents his ideas and strategies for trading products from gold to oil to interest rate futures. We encourage you to look for Tim for archived recording of Tim's past presentations as well as watch for upcoming events each month. So thank you, Tim, and thanks to Cynthia. Happy to be here. Thank you, Barbara. It's good to hear from you. I haven't talked to you in a while. Uh, Cynthia, thank you for having me back again. Um, and all of you, thank you for taking time. Yeah, hi, BJ. Uh, a lot of people are here that I uh, see from the past. It's always great to, that you would take time out and come and uh, watch the presentations, hear what I have to say. And uh, I hope that means that they're informative and useful. So let's get started. And again, hi, Barbara. Um, Again, as, as Barbara pointed out, I do two things. I manage sovereign wealth funds, um, but I mostly portfolio trade for them. And then I also, I'm in the give back portion of my career. I've been gifted uh, to be a CME member since 1980. I've been trading longer than that. So um, at this point, I focus on uh, what, what pleases me besides trading. Um, a lot of my days uh, are filled trading, but I also write and and teach a great deal at uh, Market Geometry, uh, which I founded. 
you're certainly welcome to come. There's lots of free informa information there. Certainly welcome to come. Uh, there's over 100 articles. There's links to all the uh, IB presentations. Uh, Cynthia and I have done, I, I don't know, 20 or 30, and Barbara and I have done more than that together at the CME and CBOT. They're all available online. Um, anytime we talk about anything that has anything to do with the financial industry. We need to give disclosures. Uh, I think Cynthia gave a brief one and showed you some. You can read this one uh, while I just give you the quick, uh, the quick version. And no matter what anyone says, there is no holy grail. It doesn't exist. I don't have it. No one has it. I'd be glad to give it to you. I wouldn't even sell it to you. I'd give it to you if it exists, but it doesn't. Uh, the closest thing to a holy grail is hard work and disciplining yourself. Uh, the thing that we see the most that hinders traders is their inability to be disciplined and to master themselves. It's the number one reason why traders fail, in my opinion. Um, we're going to be talking about trading T-bonds and T-notes, the futures market, at the uh, CBOT. Nothing. I think it's the most liquid market. Um, you can you can look at uh, net daily volume, and sometimes some markets in around the world may look larger, but there there is nowhere in the market where you can turn send twenty, thirty, forty thousand contracts, and not even have the market hiccup, which is a pleasure for someone like me who does trade that amount uh, for my clients as well as my own personal account. So it's lots of fun as long as you're profitable, of course. I'm going to give you one last, I'm going to say not disclaimer. Let me say it this way. Here's an important part here. This is one person's experience. Your experience may differ. And the reason why I want to point that out today is because, in general, I don't like to show exact patterns, if you will, or trade entries um, that I use, and the reason why is so many traders try to take those exact patterns and use them without any research, without any practice, um, and no two people are the same. So what works for me may or may not work for you, and this particular trade, let me go to the next slide as we talk about it. I want you to think about that. First of all, let me, I do, I've been doing this all year long. I'm going to continue to do that the rest of the year. This webcast is dedicated to my two early mentors, Dr. Alan Andrews, a Newtonian physicist, as am I, that developed the action-reaction lines and median lines in the 1920s. And of course, Amos Hostetter, the best campaign trader in the last 300 years. Um, he was one of the partners that formed Commodities Corporation, where I traded and then taught for a number of years. He was the master of risk reward and money management and uh, left us all, all too early in 1978. So um, I was lucky enough to have four or five years with him before um, he passed away in a tragic car accident, but uh, um, I wish he was still around. So let's get started with the CBOT bond futures chart. Let me point out, first of all, that these are all tick-based charts, not time-based. You could certainly do this on time-based charts. You do this on five-minute charts, 15-minute charts. And the way you would tell if you're using a time-based or a tick-based chart, if it was the right frequency or if it was a good period, is this. If you try and chart it and it's clumpy, it doesn't have any periods where it flows nicely, and it's very chunky-based, then you're too far in. If you have no pivots and just have one straight move, then you're probably too far out and you need to go to a closer time frame. And I'll take questions afterwards. And no, I don't speak uh, that language. I apologize. All right, let's see. Here's a typical tick-based 30-year T-bond chart. And this is 24-hour session. This happens to be, oh, I don't, I'd have to take a look here. This is 1,444 ticks. 
And we get those number of ticks basically by taking a look at the average number of ticks in a day and divide them into a minute and then go to something like 15 minutes or 20 minutes and then take a look and see if they're flowing nicely. And the reason why you would use tick-based charts is because at night, especially in the U.S., sometimes there are dead periods where the, the bond market doesn't trade very much, and you might have, if you, if you force the computer to print out a bar every 15 minutes, you might have 10 bars that are flat, look exactly the same, because there's nothing going on. I mean, they're moving a tick or two, but they're not moving very much. And so that skews the bond chart. So instead, we go by numbers of ticks, and that makes all, bar, all bars equal number of ticks. It makes it flow um, much more smoothly, but relative to other type of non-time-based charts, it still keeps in market structure quite nicely, which is, you'll see is going to be extremely important as we set this up. So let me diagram my favorite way to trade bond futures. And I developed this idea in 1999 after 18 months of research, and it continues to work well for me. It relies on the concept that when price forms tight energy coils or trading ranges, price is restoring its spent energy. Once it has restored this energy, it breaks out of the energy coil and usually makes a nice run. By combining this concept and rigid money management rules, I developed this concept, the corner trade for trading bonds. Now, this is one of my signature ways of taking money out of the market, out of the bond market. Um, and I do it when I, when I have time, two, three times a week, I'll find corner trades. Um, I do not use it for anything other than notes and bonds. You'll see when we get to the end of the presentation, we'll be talking about tight ranges. We apply that, and I apply that as well, to all markets. Uh, but first, let's build through trading bonds and notes, and then I'll show you how it can be applied to other markets. But this particular setup I use only in the bonds. And again, don't just go out and take this as a, a e plus B plus C uh, equals D without any research on your own part um, and try and trade these. You have to do some research, make sure you can see the trade, make sure you understand what's going on, I would even do some sim trading on it and make sure that it makes some sense to you. Your eyes may not be able to see this. Nothing doesn't mean it's anything wrong with your eyes. It just means that what I'm doing is different than, um, than what you're doing, what I can see and what I can chart. So here we go. I'm going to diagram out what I look for when I look for tight energy coils and then what I look for to make it a candidate for a corner trade. So let's take a look. First, the price, price is cascading lower over here on the left. Comes down and makes a new low. Then it'll leave some bars, same size bars. In this case, we'll have, we have two bars, double bottoms, double tops, same size bars. And in general, you'll also see that the volatility has decreased. So we might have some wide range bars on the way down and maybe a climax bar lower. Then we'll have an inside bar or a smaller range bar. We'll have double tops and double bottoms. And these bars will start to clump. The other important key ingredient is if we're on our way down, we need to be near significant support, structural support. And by structural support, I mean an area that's been tested before and left significant market structure where large limit buy orders from traders like me, whales, where they would have large limit buy orders. And so if I put an order to buy in here, if price ticks down into this area, it'll start to run into large limit buy orders. And that should hopefully protect my limit stop loss order down underneath this area of support. So let's take a look. Price continues to form these tight ranges. Look at double bottoms, double tops, double bottoms, double tops, triple bottoms, triple tops. But more importantly, take a look. It's closely clumping. 
And when price forms these tight ranges, it's literally resting, restoring the energy that it spent when it ran down. I often refer to these formations as energy coils. I like to see at least five smaller than average bars in these tight ranges, and that tells me that price has restored a good, a good deal of the spent energy. And again, don't forget, key important part, has to be a stop underneath structural support that you can afford. Tim? Yes, Tim? Uh, could I ask you to grab the laser pointer? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can't see yours. Um, I know you can, but the rest of us can't. There you go. Thank you. Sorry. My apologies. Thank you for thank you for bringing that up, Mary. Let, let me let me just go over it. Let me go back one. And just go over it real quick. So price comes down and clumps and makes double bottoms, double tops, double bottoms, double tops, triple bottoms and tops. But the key is that they're smaller range bars. They're all clumped together. That the price is not making a lower low at this point. And you can see it's a tight energy coil. The price is all boxed in. It's not really going anywhere. And the key. Uh, one more time, is that all that is, is happening relatively close to structural support where there should be large limit buy orders by whales. And it has to be within the stop size, has to be within your ability to hide your stop underneath this market structure because you're going to use this. It's like hiding behind a building if somebody's shooting at you although I hope nobody's shooting at any of you. All right, so now this is Danny, just relax, and you'll see where we're going. Now, price has come down very hard. We made a new low. We're clumping. We've restored a lot of energy. Now price is breaking out to the upside. Now, I am never, ever a breakout buyer or seller. And to me, statistically, that is one of the worst ways to trade in the market. More of those traders get washed out of their positions than any other way of trading. So that's not what we're doing here. Pay attention. Price has restored all of its energy, and it's broken out, and it started to move to the upside. So everybody is excited. But I'm not going to chase price. Jerry says he doesn't see the dot. Cynthia, you can see the dot, right? Yes, I'm seeing it. And for um, Terry, if you are having issues, notice in the lower left-hand corner there's a view menu. If you click that drop-down box, sync the display with the presenter, and hopefully that will help it show up. Thank you, Don, because I want everybody to see this. It's important. Okay. You need the red dot. So. We break out to the upside, and again, I, I'm, I'm just as excited as everybody else, but I'm not going to go chase it and buy it up here. Trading too early is one of the first cardinal sins. And if you trade up in this area, look, your stop is still all the way down here. You probably shouldn't be, you probably can't afford it. You probably shouldn't be trading up there. But price breaks above the energy coil. Let's see what happens. Well, it continues to run. After restoring its energy, price breaks out of the energy coil to the upside. Now, if I didn't manage to get in, that's okay with me. It doesn't bother me in the least. I know a lot of you are relatively new to trading, and by relatively new, I mean five years or less of profitable, of consistently profitable trading. After a while, if you want to be a profitable trader for a long period of time, you begin to learn that it doesn't matter if you get into the trade. It only matters if you get into the trade at the right time and the right place. The, the rest of those are just opportunities lost. They cost you nothing. There's always another trade. And chasing trades just to get into a trade will generally cost you money over the long haul. And that's the worst thing we can do. So price takes off out of the energy coil. And the reason why is because it's restored all this energy. It, was, it found large buyers down in this area. And after testing support and then testing support, testing support, testing support, people finally got it and they started to buy it. When it broke out, these are the breakout buyers, and now these are the stop loss 
buys being executed from the people that were selling down here in the hole. So now you have the definition of what I'm looking for. And I spent 18 months looking for this pattern, just this and nothing else. And I mean, with tons and tons, I have a very, very extensive computer system and had even better programming then than I have now. I've, I've gone simple these days, but I spent, I can't tell you how many thousands of hours developing, the, just looking for this particular pattern. I had three or four different candidates, but this is exactly what I'm looking for. And you can flip it over if you, or stand on your head if you want to, to see it, to see what the other side would look like. But you can imagine what it looks like. It clumps, then it breaks out to the downside. The key would be that you'd have to have run up and then have resistance up above this formation that you could afford to put your stop above. So let's see how we would relate this to median lines. D Danny, just slow down, everybody. I'll answer questions afterwards. The presentation, we have lots of slides left. You'll see step by step exactly where I'm going, what I'm interested in doing, why I'm doing it. And I'll take questions at the end if, if for, for some reason I didn't answer something. So let's take a look. This is the structural support that has all the whales interested in buying. And they left all their orders here. And that's what stopped this move. It came all the way down from this B pivot to the C pivot. It worked its way down rather quickly. And now we're clumping right here. This is the same formation as before, the beginning of the same formation. We're clumping. And when I see it start to clump, I draw on a median line at the structural support, the major high, and now at the lowest low of this clump. If the clump gets broken, I'll just take the median line out and redraw again. It's okay. Here's the structural support. I see double tops, double bottoms, double tops, double bottoms. This is what I want to do. Somewhere in here in the clump, after I get five bars going at least, there's smaller volatility, same size bars, double tops, double bottoms. We can talk about later on, and I'll show you on actual charts, mirror bars, which have the same size, but alternate closes. I take a look at the size of the stop, and what I want to do is I'm going to spend at most eight ticks on the initial stop, but I like it when it's around five ticks. And that will give me an idea for an entry. And you can see I got in here. I would get in here as price clumped, and then price takes off to the upside. Now, there's some odd money management rules. This is the one exception in my entire trading portfolio where I don't use a risk reward of three to one or greater. The percentage of winners on this trade for me, now this is where you have to be careful. The percentage of winners for me is near 80%. And with 80% winning percentages, I can afford to lower my risk reward if I do the following. What I'm going to do is, if I enter here, I'm going to put my stop underneath the major support, and I'm going to immediately put a limit sell order in eight ticks above my entry for one half of the position. So I'll take profits on one half of the position, eight ticks above, which is probably right in around here. Then, if that's filled, I'll immediately go to break even on the balance so that even if it then retraces, at most, excuse me, at worst, I'll have harvested four ticks in the bonds, which, by the way, is about five S&P handles. And this is fairly repeatable 
and you see it quite a bit in the bonds once you learn to spot the pattern. I like to be extremely picky. And that's why I get such a high winning percentage. But I've been doing this pattern for quite some time. But once again, please don't rush out and try and trade this. Do your research. Make sure that you see what I see. And sim result, get the same sim results that I'm getting before you go out and try and trade this. Um, I've said this before in, in other uh, sessions here. Don't believe me. Don't believe anything that anyone else tells you unless you prove it to yourself that it's the truth. Because even if I'm seeing those results, you may not be, out, be seeing them. So it's extremely important that you don't run out tomorrow and buy a 1,000 bonds and then get stopped out and say, oh, this doesn't work. It's extremely important that you take it apart, make sure all the pieces work, then use your normal leverage. And first, if I were you, I would sim trade it. But it looks very simple when I show it to you. And it is, once you learn how to spot it, a very simple trade and very repeatable. But you really do need to practice it yourself. Why am I preaching, ca preaching caution? As I said, I'm in, in the give back phase of my career. And one thing I, I uh, don't want anyone to do is lose money because they watch somebody like me who's been trading. I've been trading f more 40, going on 42 years now. It's, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, and it looks easy even if you watch me trade live or if you watch me give presentations. It can look extremely easy. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to lead anybody down the path of taking losses just because it looks easy when I show you. So now let's take a look at a tick-based CBOT bond futures chart from a recent session and see if we can find a potential corner trade in the bond futures. Now these trades are real. Uh, one reason why I give Cynthia ulcers is because I like the trades to be recent, or as recent as possible, and still get them into compliance. And we always stretch that window as close as we can, Cynthia. And uh, I apologize, but you know, you know, I do it out of love because that makes the the, version, the uh, sessions more interesting. But they always manage to get in and get taken care of. And your compliance people are wonderful, of course. So let's take a look. Here we are in the bond market. And here, let's take let's take a look now. What do we have? We have a very sharp sell-off. Then we have a nice run-up, very quick pullback. So here's our A point, here's our B point, here's our C point, and price is heading back lower now. Price breaks prior lows, and right now we're just we're just ca I'm just casually watching the market, kicking the tires, watching the bars unfold. This is if you look, this is Eastern time. This is prime time in the bonds as is, you know, 7, 7.20 to about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, Eastern time. We're sorry, sorry, it's Chicago time, so uh, 8.20 to 11 Eastern time. So price breaks prior lows. And let's take a look. Here we are breaking prior lows. Here we trace it a little bit, and you can see it. Just, I call this a cascade lower. Just stair steps lower. Stair steps lower. And now what's it start to do? Comes down, makes a low. And you can see it's clumping. Same size bars, same size bars. Even here, we're, we're really clumping. Where before, look, look here, we're running. Price is clumping, leaving double tops and double bottoms. Now it starts to break above some of the highs. So I start to pay attention. Now let's take a look at my my own filter. Why would or I wouldn't I why would or wouldn't I look at different areas? 
why didn't I consider this as a potential corner trade? And why would I consider this? Is price just cascading lower or something different going on? Well, take a look. This is especially the last bars here. You can see this is exactly what I'm looking for. Same size bars, multiple tops, multiple bottoms. The volatility is tamped down. More important, I've got prior lows here. This is where the whales are likely to have limit buy orders. So I take a look at the size. And if I put my stop all the way up here, that's one heck of a stop. If I put my stop here, pretty significant. Let's go back one. Now take a look here. So we were looking at this area, no stop. We were looking at this area, and we'll talk about the stop in a second. But look how large the stop is. And you didn't have to count the pips. Just take a look at the ticks. Yeah, just take a look at it. It's larger than the formation we're looking at. Now take a look here. We're clumping nicely, and our stop is really much smaller. So here, the size of the stop, it's just too large. And take a look to the left. We have some very wise people at Market Geometry uh, that are members that I'm, I'm always amazed at some of the things that, that people uh, comment on. Um, and uh, one of them was, look left to be right. And that's a, that's a very prescient saying. Is this really a swing low? It really is just in the middle of this swing. Hasn't taken out a high, hasn't taken out the low. It's nothing. The only thing it has going for it, it is, it is the last low right before price started to head up. But as a whale, and I am one of the larger traders in bond futures when I trade bond futures, if I'm interested in buying, I'm interested in buying down in this area here. I figure it is a zone. This, nothing, it's not, I'm not going to move up to here. It's not interested. Price makes its way all the way up here. If it's heading down, I see nothing that makes me want to move my orders to chase this area. So you have to keep that in mind. Where are the buyers? Where are the sellers? And you're talking about large buyers, buyers that pe people that are looking to buy 30,000, 40,000 bond futures. Or a group that's willing to buy 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 bond futures. And they're not going to be hiding underneath this little poke here. So where's the real interest to buy? It's down here. This stop is just too large. And these two are look like similar cascades, although I'm starting to like the clumping here, and it's got me sitting up and taking interest. The size of the stop would filter me out from taking this trade. So... After the triple bottom, we leave one, two, three bottoms, and we've clumped up. We poked a little higher. I like that. Now I draw in a new median line, and it's blue, and it's upsloping. From this pivot, here's my A, here's my B, here's my C. And I know because this was near vertical. From my studies, I like something called a shift, a modified shift median line. And the modified shift just takes the A pivot only. It leaves the same C and B pivot. It takes the A pivot. It moves it up 50% towards B. So if you drew a line horizontal here, it goes halfway up. And if you drew a line vertical from the middle of BC, it goes to the center. So I'm just going to go up 50%, over 50%. And that gives me my new A pivot and that shifts, it gentles the slope of this median line. Take a look. You can see it just gentles it a little bit. And I know from long years of using it, obviously, but also from statistics, that when we get in these vertical moves, the modified shift generally works better 
at capturing the probable path of price, which is what I'm going to use it for. This B, C swing is really straight down, although it's a cascade, but it's straight down and near vertical. Now, what am I thinking? I'm thinking that price has already started to take out some highs. The volatility is tamped down. It's showing nice clumping. I've got significant buyers at prior lows. I could put my stop at 150.104 below the prior lows. I can get along at 150.108 if price comes back down. I'll be risking only four ticks in the bonds. If price works its way higher, I'm going to have an order in to sell half of my position out, eight ticks above my entry at 151.16. If I get that limit order filled to sell, I'll move to break even on the rest. So the worst that happens is I'll make four ticks on the entire entry. If price continues higher, my profit target is actually going to be at what is now an energy point formed by this down sloping upper parallel and the median line from the modified shift that I'm using on the lower parallel to get long. These energy coils are often price magnets, plus or minus about five bars. So price tends to get attracted to them. They're good areas to leave profit orders. Does price accelerate through them sometimes? Sure. That's okay with me, though. If that happens, I've taken out my piece. This is what I framed as my trade. If I can get this out and do this on a significantly regular basis, something like 75 to 80% of the time, I don't care what happens after that. It's meaningless to me. I've done what I wanted to do. Now, I have one problem with this trade that you might or might not have picked up on. I am getting long against the gently upsloping line. That's the good news. The bad news is I've not chosen to use the gently upsloping median line as my profit target. Instead, I'm not sure that the major median line is not the significant, showing me the significant path of price. So if we go to the right, of this energy point, I'm going to trail my profit target with the red down sloping upper parallel. In other words, if we get over here, I'm going to be moving my profit target lower and lower and lower, and that means the profit potential of this trade will reduce as each bar prints to the right. I'll just run my cursor up, and you'll see me do this. I'll run my cursor up to figure out where my profit target is. If it gets to the point where it's at 8 ticks, I'll just leave it at 8 ticks with a break-even if I get filled, with a break-even stop loss. So that's the one downside to this particular trade. On a lot of trades, if I don't have a, a down-sloping meeting line in front of me that I think is going to limit price, I may just let it run and just trail all the way up underneath market structure and never get stopped out and get stopped out. And let's say I might have a profit target all the way up here at prior highs. But in this case, I'm going to use the downsloping upper parallel, red upper parallel. Let's see how we go. So price does come down. You can see it fills me, and I'm long at 150.108. My initial stop loss is at 150.104, so I'm risking four ticks. Now, on this one, I'm going to sell one half of my bonds if price gets to 151.16, which is an eight tick profit. So, this is a two to one risk reward, which is lower than I generally accept if I'm trading anything. If I'm trading commodities or foreign exchange or e mini SPs or bonds using a different method, I don't accept anything below three to one on risk reward. In this case, because of the setup and the high winning percentage that I experience, I'm willing to accept lower risk reward. Although, 
when I look at it on a monthly basis because you'll see that sometimes price runs significantly farther than my eight ticks. The second half will give me such a high payoff that I'll get the four or a five to one on a regular basis. And when I average out the month, it'll average out above three to one. But when I plan each trade, each individual instance, if you will, the risk reward is often less than three to one. So here we're at two to one at the moment. So we're long at 151.08. We've got orders in to sell half the position out at 151.16. Our initial logic uh, profit target is at the energy point. Okay, so price works its way higher. It makes it to 151.16. So I have now sold out half the position at 151.08. So I'm sorry, that I bought at 150.08. At 151.16, I've made eight ticks. And I've now moved my initial stop loss at 151.04 all the way up to break even at 08. So the worst that happens on the second half is that I get stopped out of break even, which means on average I've made four ticks in the bonds. Now my profit target on balance on the rest is at 151.20, which is at the upper parallel, red parallel, and you can see it's below the modified shift median line. And the further we mark our way down, the less I'm going to make on this trade. That's the one downside of this particular trade. Price comes up. I get filled at 151.19. You can see I continue to every bar I would just measure over, and all I do is I run my cursor straight up. Say, okay, where should, where should my price order be, my limit sell order for the next bar? And here, I had moved from 20 to 19, and in the next bar, I got filled at 151.19. So I made eight ticks on half the position, 11 ticks on the second half. I rolled forward just under 10 ticks on the entire position which is 8 plus 11 divided by 2. So basically, I rolled forward about two stops worth of profits into my account, which means that if I'm stopped out two times trading bonds using this methodology, the next, time, the next two times, I'll still be playing with a little bit of the market's money. I won't be playing with my own account. So it takes some pressure off if you think of it. If you stop thinking in terms of actual money, start thinking in terms of units or ticks or numbers of stops, anything that's non-dollar based or, or cash based. Uh, you know, if you're in Germany, I don't know if you want to think about it in uh, Deutschmarks or the Euro, it depends, I guess, on which day it is. But um, any, anything that, instead of thinking of cash, units, stops, ticks, anything you can do that will take that out of your psychology will help you uh, take some of the stress out of your trading. So this trade was managed exactly as I This is how I expect this trade to go over and over and over. Sometimes it gets out of break even on the second half. Only about 20% of the time do I ever get stopped out on the entire trade. And lots of times, I'll get 10 ticks more, 20 ticks more. Sometimes I'll get two points more. At least twice a month on average, I get more than one full point on the second half. So as I said, overall, my risk reward is above three to one on the month, but on each separate instance, it's lower. Let's take a look. Now that we know the concepts involved in a corner trade, let's take a look and see if we can spot another. Now remember, we're looking for tight energy coils that are forming where price should reverse direction, support or resistance based on market structure and or median lines. So here we are. Does this median line look familiar to you? should. We just took profit on it right here. 
Now, generally, in my trading week, yeah, same chart. That's right. Thanks, Danny. Generally, in my trading, in a normal week, I teach live uh, in market geometry Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, and Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, um, in the mornings, early, I'm preparing for what we're doing, um, along with my partner, Shane, Hank and Chip. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, I generally mentor some students privately. Some of them are CTAs, some of them are hedge fund managers, some of them are just beginning traders. I also, until recently, well, school's out now, so it hasn't, it hasn't been for the last month. I also trade, uh, teach about 12,000 fifth graders how to trade in a program uh, in 39 states. Um, and I do that um, on Friday, but on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I do prep for that. But I, all, I generally have a nice chunk, about a three-hour chunk in the morning, where I'm able to market, uh, trade the markets um, in the morning for a good three hours, intraday trade which generally I watch the bond market and uh, cash for an exchange. So I pick up a lot of bond trades uh, on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. And um, this happened to be a week where I could clean my calendar out and knock a little rust off and do quite a few trades. I think I got four bond trades in on this and this week. And I have, uh, I'm, I'm welcoming a new investor. I haven't had a new investor uh, since 1991. Um, in my portfolio. Um, these are all sovereign wealth fund um, investors. And um, this particular investor just celebrated or is just celebrating 60 years in office, uh, if that gives you a, uh, some inclination. And uh, congratulations to her on a successful and wonderful uh, job for herself and for her country. So this is the same chart, and uh, the trades that you, that you see um, I made this week. Um, it was the, the first action um, in, in her account, and uh, had, had quite a very nice week trading bonds. And one of those weeks, as I said, where it was nice, I got three or four trades. I think I had four trades that week, um, and all four were were, were quite nice. So this is the second median line. This is the major median line that we had started out with, downsloping red median line. And we had just taken profit right here at 19. Let's see what we can make out of this. Here it is. We just zoomed in. By the way, here's a little, here's a little tip for you if you're trading tick-based charts. I know Ensign done this, does this. I'm pretty sure MetaTrader does this. Um, and my guess is, I know, tra as a matter of fact, I know TradeStation will do this if you know how to turn it on and or write, you might have to write the code. But this will tell you how, what percentage of ticks in your tick base bar has, has happened. It's important to know because if only 5% has gone on and you're drawing conclusions about the bar, it's a little bit early. So you want to wait until later on in the bar, until we're at about 85% of the bar finished or 90% to get too excited, unless the bar is really forming fast. So I leave that turned on whenever I have tick-based bars going on in, in uh, on my charting. And uh, so here we are. This is the same median line. And I apologize, you can hear my voice disintegrating. I've got one of those strange summer colds. I can't seem to get rid of it. And uh, Talking doesn't always help, but prices come down. This was a uh, this was us. There's our clumping down in this area, and prices moving higher, and price has made double tops, double bottoms. These are actually mirror bars, a lower close then a higher close, same high, same low. Mirror bars tell us. To pay attention. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the term, it's something I coined. Uh, pay attention. There's generally something is about to happen. Uh, it doesn't give us a directional bias, but it tells us that if you already have a position on, check your risk, tighten it up, make sure you have the risk on that you want. 
if you're looking for entries, you might want to pay attention and say, okay, is there something for me to do here? Now, no trade is perfect. No trade setup. A setup to me, and what we teach at Market Geometry, um, is a series of events. It's not one thing. It's not one bar. It's not three bars. It's not just the clumping of the bars, for example. It also has to do with stops. It has to do with many different things. It has to do with are you trading with the flow. It has to do with the size of the stop. It has to do with um, is it a repeatable pattern that you've seen before. Um, it has to do with the market structure that you're basing uh, your opinion on um, and your stops on. Many things go into framing up a trade in a trade entry. But again, this is how a corner trade is designed. Now, there, as I said, nothing is perfect, but I'm flowing a little freer now because I've already put some money in my pocket. Now, I would like more clumping here. I would like, so if I think about it, there's maybe one, two, three, four, five things, and I go through the list, and I check them off, and I say, I won't risk more than eight ticks. Well, let me, let me take a look. If I'm going to use this as my stop above this swing, this is cascading lower, and when this low is taken out, this becomes a swing high. Take a look at seven ticks. It barely makes it, but it makes it. That's okay. Um, I'll take questions, and I'll be glad. Uh, John, John, I'll be, I'll be glad to answer your question later. These bars all have the same high. You're looking at an optical illusion. I would like more clumping here. So if there's five things, this is one of the things that I don't like about this trade. But I'm swinging a little freer. In fact, John, you know what? That, let me bring something up. You could draw this. You can see there's one, two, three, four bars that all have the same high. And again, it's an optical illusion. They're, they're all the same. You can draw it on the left, you can draw it on the right, you can draw it in the middle, it doesn't matter. Okay? And the way to tell, and uh, let me go back one, two, there we go. The way to tell basically is when you draw it, if you move it to the right, you can take a look and see if you, get, my first inclination is always if you have same size tops is always take the first top. Second is to take the top to the right. The third is to take one of the middles. But the way to tell us tests on the tail as it comes through or action on the BC pivot. And the one that gave us the best action, if you take a look closer, if you could take a look closer here, is by going to this farthest one on the left. It gave us the same slope basically as these highs. Short of that, there's really no difference in any of the tops. It wouldn't matter. So there are little things. Those are picky things. But there are things that you will always have questions on. And it's good to have those types of questions. Glad you pointed it out. So anyway, <clears throat> what I don't like, again, is lack of clumping here. But I like that there are mirror bars. Closes lower, then closes higher. Same size high. Same size low. I'm swinging a little freer because I've got some money put in the bank from the prior trade that I just got out of. It's also in prime time. So the bond market's still active. I want to sell at 151.19. My initial stop is seven ticks higher, 151.26. I'm going to take one-half profits 
eight ticks below. If that gets filled, I'll go to break even. Is this the best looking corner trade I've ever seen? No. Doesn't make my top 50%. But I know that over time, after looking at so many of these, if they meet a certain number of the criteria and I follow the money management diligently, things work out pretty well. So let's take a look. Price should run out of energy in this area. That's Dr. Andrews' number one rule. Price should run out of energy, should stop and reverse at the upper parallel, or it should accelerate. But if it's going to stop, it'll stop at the upper parallel. That changes 101. Price is clumping up, as we talked about, leaving double tops, double bottoms, same size bars, multiple tops, bottoms, mirror bars, right in an area where price should pause. And price should pause, as Dr. Andrews said again, right at the upper parallel. We know that there are major sellers at our C pivot. Now the question is, is this a swing high and have major sellers moved here? I think it's enough of a swing high that I'm willing to take the trade. It's not the most gorgeous setup I've seen, but price is cascading lower nicely. This is our first swing. This is our first pullback. When we take out this low, I'm willing to call this a swing high. One thing I don't, another thing I don't like particularly about this trade, which we used to our advantage, by the way, in the prior trade, is that prior price did not test the median line on its move back lower this first time, and this is a sign of strength. In the back of my mind, that's bothering me, but that's what stops are for. Am I willing to risk seven ticks? Knowing the winning percentage that I have on this trade and having two sets of stops rolled forward? Yeah, I am. I am. But these are the positives and negatives that you should go through when you set up this trade. On other mornings, you might decide this is not enough clumping or this is not you don't like, this is called the Hagopian rule. You might, might decide the Hagopian rule bothers you too much and you're not going to take this trade. You pass on it, that's fine. Let's take a look and see what we get. We get short at 151.19. We take half our profit at 151.11. We move to break even on the balance. And you can see price works its way lower. My profit target is at the median line this time. I'm going for a bigger bear. Price comes down. Doesn't make it to the median line, but makes it a good 90%. Turns around. I have a stop profit now above these triple tops right here. As price works its way lower, I just keep moving my profit stop lower and lower. Once it goes vertical, there's no place for me to put a profit stop. I'm not going to go to the market down here. Price comes up. My profit stop gets hit at 151.08 on the second half. So let's see. What do we got? What do we grab? We grabbed uh, eight on the first half, and we grabbed. 11 on the second half, same as we did before. We're out. Now price is back up in this area. Let's take a look at one more corner trade in the bond futures. And this one is based on much more advanced and complex market structure. In the last three sessions, we've talked about gaps, and the gaps are pivots 
They have a high pivot, a low pivot, and you can even use the center if you want. This is Dr. Andrews work. And we talked about how to use them. If you did not attend that and you want to know in depth um, how to use them, go back the last two or three sessions. You can find them on uh, IB's page, web page, go to their educational section or just search my last name and uh, take a look at we're, we're here the second Thursday of every month and uh, you can take a look and we use in the last two or three sessions every, every one we used open gaps. So this gap that opens higher just rips this chart in two. Think of it this way. If you printed this out and grabbed this end with your hand, grabbed this end with the other hand, and just ripped this chart right like that, right in half on, a, on the diagonal. And it rips price action. Price action is no longer continuous. Now, price was going relatively exponential or almost vertical to begin with. But when it rips apart from it, look at it go. It's just ripping higher. Price has rocketed to the new trading zone to the upside. And this is pure price discovery, meaning we're in a new era. Price hasn't been up here. And so every bar is new territory. And it's no longer connected to the prior price action. It's extremely important to understand. And what generally happens, <coughs> as we talked about in the last two weeks, or last two sessions, when price goes, we, we form this tight energy coil, and you can see it. Then we gap open higher. When price goes vertical, it tends to come back just as fast because it has to return to balance. We know from our studies that when price goes vertical, it will expend all of its stored energy and then generally retraces the vertical run equally fast. Think of it as a rocket shot into space that comes back to Earth after failing to leave the Earth's gravity. Price gets overextended, then it has to return back to balance. Now, these magenta lines are multi-pivot lines, and they describe an area of probable support. They're the bottom of the energy coil, and some multiple highs and lows just below it. These are where the whales are going to be, anywhere in here, including the energy coil. You're going to find large, significant buyers. And by the way, look to the left. See the spike higher? Right in the zone. So whales are going to eye that up and say, you know, as this thing comes back to Earth, I think I'll pick some up at here and see if price holds. Logical target, target before it slows down on its descent. It may fill the open gap. If it does, look for it to test the prior tight energy coil right here that held the energy price gap higher. Or if look for it to hold, as I said, these prior highs and lows just below the energy gap that go right over to this spike. These are the areas I eye up as a whale. These are prime buying areas. Price rockets higher, heads lower, fills the gap. Heads back a little bit higher. Call it a do -si do Just doing a little bit of dancing around then heads back lower. So at this point, people are not really sure that this market is done selling off. Price comes down, tests the multi-pivot lines, and this is a zone, if you will. I should have drawn it. It goes all the way over to this spike high where price ran out of energy to the upside before. Think about it, what was resistance is probably now support. So we're now in that zone. And price, if you take a look, we've kind of started to curl, haven't we? Let's move in a little bit, I think is what we're going to do. Yeah. What does price do? Price forms an energy coil. So a very tight energy coil, much like this one, 
forms again. Multiple tops, multiple bottoms in a tight range. Now, what happens the last time we had a tight energy coil? Price broke out and made a significant move. Doesn't mean it has to break out to the upside this time, although you do have the multi-pivot lines below as significant support, which lends credence to the probability that it will break out to the upside. But let's see what we get. Is this clumping? And should I be looking for a corner trade in this area? That's what's running through my mind. <coughs> Excuse me. Key multi-pivot lines were tested, and large buy orders left by the whales, people like me, appeared, which is why people are now starting to punch to the upside. Let's zoom in. I guess not. Let's draw a median line. Pivot A. Here's our zoom higher we talked about. It ran out of energy. This is the lowest low. We'll use this for pivot A. Our highest high, this was our gap higher. This is where we became overextended. We use that for pivot B. And this is the energy coil that we're currently formed. The lowest low, which is about, which is actually touching this lowest multi pivot line, we'll use that as the C pivot. And you can see, again, price, there's almost a curling quality to it. I especially like to see that right after a tight energy coil. So now this is a traditional median line, not a modified shift, because price has spent so much time expending energy in a near vertical fashion, a modified shift median line may describe the path of price better. But you look, the line of force is near vertical. Take a look at it. There's no pullbacks at all. So let's see what the modified shift looks like. Here's a modified shift. All I did was I moved the A point up 50%, over 50%. That's where it ends up. Now I want to take a look at the handle, which I talked about before. This is the handle. It bisects the BC line and heads down to A, and in this case we've shifted it up 50%, over 50%. What does it do? It does a beautiful job of cutting through the action here. I love the way it bisects the gap. I take a look at the even the BC line. I take a look. Look at the highs and the lows. It does a very good job. I like everything about this modified shift median line. Okay? Let's see what we can do with it. This is what I'm interested in doing. I have significant support below. Every whale in the world, including me, seems to be interested in buying bonds against this tight energy coil, the current tight energy coil, and this spike high. We've marked it out with these magenta lines. If I get filled, it's at 143.20. I'm going to risk five ticks, 143.15. Stop loss is perfect. It's just exactly dead center what I like to use, five ticks in the bonds. If I get filled, my initial order is going to be to sell one half the order, eight ticks higher at 143.28. I'll move to break even if that's filled. Then my interest will be to sell the balance at the median line. Now note, this time I'm selling against an upsloping median line. And take a look. This is how I figure out where the profit target should be. I drew in a dotted line. I just run my cursor up. And it tells me to take profit. If price on the very next bar hits the median line, it will be at 144.12. And each at each bar, I'll just keep going to the next bar and say, okay, the price now should be here, or it should be here, or it should be here. And the reason why you, it's important that you take, if you're using this as your profit target and it's upsloping, that you take that extra profit is because the longer you have this position on, the longer you have your capital exposed to risk. So you're exposed to news, financial shock, whatever. 
and you need to get paid for taking that risk, especially these days. You know, we had the Swiss pegged uh, a few months ago. They gave us 500 ticks in about, I don't know, three, four minutes. Uh, we had a huge move over the weekend in the end. Um, there have been lots of shocks. So if you're going to have an open position, you need to get paid for the risk while it's open. So every little point or pip that you can squeeze out of it, squeeze out of it. It's very important. Attention to small details like this add up to large sums of money over a trading month, week, year, career. See what happens. Price comes back down again. I get long at 114.20. I check to make sure that my stop order is in at 143.15. I can now put in my limit sell order on one half at 143.28, which would take me eight ticks of profit out. And I also put in a limit sell order for the second half at 144.12. Quite a difference. Okay. Price hits my first limit sell order at 143.28, so I'm out of half at an eight tick profit. I measure my profit target. Remember, it was at, sorry, it's left in my mind, 144.12. I measure up. Now it's at 144.14. It's only two ticks, but two ticks is 66 and change dollars per contract. Plenty of do re mi if you're trading multiple contracts. So I check to make sure that I have the right number of bonds in my limit sell order and the right number of bonds in my break even stop loss order. I make sure that my initial stop loss is canceled. And I've already booked eight ticks. Price moves forward a little bit and you can see I haven't made much progress. We're just kind of clumping along now. This was my profit target at twelve. Here's my profit target at fourteen. We have a lot, almost a zone of resistance, and the zone is formed by the median line and the prior highs, and it's kind of a box at this point. So anywhere up in there, I want to take profits. In fact, if I get even vaguely close, I'm going to make sure I lock in profits because I've got a lot of, a lot of overhead resistance. doesn't mean bonds aren't going to go quite a bit higher, but I want to make sure if it gets up there that I get a chance to take my profit. So now my profit target is two ticks higher at 16. I was at 12, moved it to 14, now I'm at 16. Sold half of my position out at an eight tick profit, and I'm at break even on the balance for a stop loss. Price eventually breaks out and heads higher, and you can see, I believe I moved, at one point I put a profit stop here, just above 144, but it never breaks any of the, even the minor, they're really not swings, but the minor lows. It just continues to head higher. I finally get filled at 144.16 on the second half, so I made 8 ticks on one half of the position and 28 ticks on the second half. I rolled forward 36 ticks, roughly seven stops. So that means I risked five to make 36. In the end, even though it looked like on most of these trades I'm risking, I'm doing a risk reward of two to one, here's a seven to one. Overall, at the end of the month, these generally average out to be better than three to one. So now, hang on. Everybody good? We're gonna to go to do something a little bit more advanced. 
Uh, I'll take. I'm going to take. I'll, I'll take questions afterwards that are that are not absolutely uh, germane to what we're talking about at the moment. But I'll get. You, I'll get you in a minute. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, so hang on. We're going to go into extremely advanced market structure and see if we can mine a trade in the bond futures because we're using tight energy coils. You might not see this. That's okay. Let it soak in. You can come back and watch this over and over. Some of you may pick it up right away. So let's take a look. This is where we got out. We entered down in here nicely. It clumped. A whole lot of nothing going on there for a little bit. But then again, take a look at what time it was, 3 o'clock in the morning. Cynthia was probably up working, but I was getting my beauty sleep. I like to get a good uh, six, seven hours of sleep. So my profit orders and, and stop loss orders were in the market, and nothing was going on. No need to watch. The orders are there. That's fine. I get up and check. I'm filled or I'm not filled. Price finally takes off. Excuse me, let me cough. Uh, <coughs> price finally takes off to the upside. And now we're back in, bo in bond prime time. You can see 8 o'clock in the morning, New York time. And of course, we start to get activity. Comes up to the median line. What does Dr. Andrews say? Price is going to stop and reverse at the median line. And sure enough, right at the median line, price stops and reverse and starts to head lower. Is this median line finished now? It's accomplished its first task. Eight, with 80% probability, if it starts to take out highs from the lower parallel, it should make the median line. And you can see here that price made it from the lower parallel to the median line. So it's made its first goal in life, if you will. That's what this swing was supposed to do. And remember, I was also worried about this prior high. We didn't quite make it, but we missed it by just a couple of ticks. And that's close enough for jazz for most, in most markets. This is about where you'd expect price to stop. And it stopped and turned. Is the median line finished now? We don't know. Price could come back down and test this lower parallel and turn around again. Or price could stop here, head higher, take out all the highs and keep right on going. We really don't know. Now, well, how do you feel about this median line? This is where we took our profits. Notice, price was unable to make it to the lower parallel. Then it began another march higher. This might have been another corner trade, by the way. In fact, it was a corner trade. But no need to do to diagram out four or five. We, we went through enough. But take a look. Price exceeded these highs now, made a new high for the move. But again, didn't make it to the median line. Starting to get sloppy now. Headed down, and if you drew a line that was parallel to this lower parallel and grabbed this low, you can see where price stopped. It's right around in here. Then when it took this out, it zoomed through the lower parallel. This is an important concept. And Andrew says when price zooms through a median line or one of its parallels, it will come back and retest it. And sure enough, watch. Price zooms through. And it comes back and retests it. Now we're from the back side, and price fails. I assume most of you feel at this point that this median line is pretty much useless. If we can't shift it, it's already a modified shift. It's as gentle as it can be, so to speak. So the next question is, what about the multi-pivot lines in magenta. Are they useless? And these are the questions that you should be asking yourself. Are the buyers still there? We identified the first time that there probably should be sellers in this area, and that worked out pretty good for us. We didn't have to sit through that. Now, eventually, they were taken out. The question is now, are there buyers formed by this energy coil, this energy coil, and the spike high that's over there, if you remember.
price fails, works its way lower, stair steps lower, and we're right at the lower set of magenta median lines where we had buyers before. Here's the spike high. Now if we get below here, I would say this is the first poke below. Below here, and it's clear that the large buyers of the whales are no longer interested. Multi-pivot lines are lines where price touches it a number of times. So look at look look at these lines. Look at all the bottoms that touch this line. Look at all the tops over here that touch this line. Pretty simple stuff. Some people might call them trend lines, but they don't become multiple pivot lines until it's been tested more than two times. That's all. Fancy language. A trend line that's been tested a bunch of times. How about that? Visually, large buyers, whales, are going to be interested in this area. Now we're right back down to this magenta line again. I want each of you to take a moment and think. Would you be interested in getting long against these tested multi-pivot lines with a stop, let's say five ticks below, so be below this poke? Or do you think price has done its job? While you think about it, let me just tell you, the boys and girls, the fifth graders I teach, I don't teach them median line theory. I teach them simple, we call them mountains and valleys. And to all of you, this should look like a big, fat mountain. And what they do is they trade stocks only, and they can only be long. And they look for mountains like this that have support underneath that they can afford. If they can afford it, they have a certain percent of their uh, account or size of stops that they can use. If they can afford to buy a tested mountain here, here's a mountain. You can see it came down and got filled, had a stop, worked great. Here's another mountain. You want to make a mountain purchase with a stop below? There's another way to think about it. Same basic idea. So the question is, Will the mountain hold, or will this multi-pivot line hold? Or will we bust through, and are we headed down to this low? If this holds, where should we go? A move above here says that the next swing should be headed for the prior highs. That's its goal in life. A break below here says that this swing should be move, moving to test prior lows. That's its goal in life. So you should be asking yourself, if I'm trading based purely on market structure, which is what the fifth graders that I teach, by the way, their rate of return this year turned out to be an astounding. They only traded two months in the first half of the year and two months in the second half of the year. 12,000 students, their average rate of return unannualized was 17.4%. There isn't a fund manager or a CTA manager that wouldn't like to have their rate of return and their drawdown. And now one reason they're able to trade that way is because they don't have any weight on their shoulders. They're not paying mortgages. They don't have investors calling them. They don't have Barclays Hedge Fund calling them asking what their rate of return is for the week so that, you know, did I make the top ten or not? Uh, they don't have to pay bills. Mom and Dad are taking care of it. So they're able to actually just think of it as an exercise and just follow what they should be doing. I'm going to give you a hint. The fifth graders would take this trade every time. Period. So if you're a hedge money, hedge money manager, I see you there. Wouldn't you like 17.4% rate of return unannualized for only four months of trading? Pretty good work, huh? Not me, and I don't, I don't help at all. I just make sure that they understand what the rules are, how to identify mountains and valleys, and 
their teachers make sure that they don't violate the rules. If there are questions, they send me charts and they have, may have, have me make a ruling. Um, and we had some interesting uh, controversy at the end of the year that moved one panelist out of second, or one child, not a child, they're not children in fifth grade, uh, one young adult from third to first, um, and one from first out entirely. But they did darn good. So let's take a look how they would have done. When it takes out this high, I can truthfully say, and so it begins again. And would I take this trade any day of the week? What's important to me? Let's take a look. It's this tight coil here. It's this tight coil here. It's the gap that was formed. It's the spike high that was rejected. Then we came back and gapped above it, above the energy coil. That gave us this beautiful projection. This is the line of balance. And you should think about balance in terms of energy throughout not only trading, but your life. Even when we teach at market geometry, we find that we move to extremes. One day we'll be talking about extremely advanced material. And after doing two or three sessions of extremely advanced material, uh, my partner and I, Shane and I, come to the conclusion, you know, without even talking, you know, we better bring it back to balance and head back to uh, foundation material. So we come back to basic material. We have to come back to balance as well. Same thing in your life. If you trade 20 hours a day, you're going to burn out pretty fast, and you're not going to last. So it's important for you to think about things coming to extremes, back to balance. Extremes, back to balance. If we broke them below, we'd probably be heading down here. When we start to take out highs here, where are we likely heading? We're likely heading, we have a date with this prior high. We should be filling the valley, as somebody asked before, yes. We should probably come and test the valley. And so it begins again. Take a look. Tight coil, tight energy coil, gap higher. We had the spike high that you don't see that's over here, but you'll all remember it. That's what gets the whales interested. They've got orders. They're sitting here. They're patient. Whales don't chase price ever. Guppies chase fight, chase price. Retail traders, medium-sized traders, institutional traders, whale traders, people like me that trade large amounts of money, we, we can't afford to chase price. We're not interested. We're very patient. If I go two weeks without a trade in the bonds, that's okay with me. Now I have other ways, other entries that I can use. I trade all kinds of things, so I'm in no hurry to trade. But when I see this type of action, these tight coils form, I know that they're setting up a line of balance. If price had broken through, I would have found a way to get short. If I missed the trade, I missed the trade. That's okay. In this case, getting long is easy. The stop is no problem at all. And where's my probable target? It's filling this valley. And look at us go. We come down, we clump. It's the same basic trade. It's over here. By the way, I love these trades. I love. There's nothing better for me than the corner trades. I love these trades. My partner Shane loves seeing these tight areas and then project them out to space and then wait for this action to happen and have it. So he loves mountain trading. I take these as well, but I've been doing these for so long that I just I live for these. I just they're just like falling off a rock. They're just a lot of fun. Of course. When you get this kind of follow through on any trade, it's always a lot of fun. But this is more of my partner style, Shane. He'll watch this and say, okay, I'm going to use this line later on. I don't know how long it'll take, but this line's going to come and pay off in spades. And sure enough, take a look. What do we take? Four or five days? Long time in the bonds. 
But was it worth the wait? Hey, this is a month's worth of profit right here for most people. A couple handles in a very short period of time. If you can identify market structure and then identify where the large buyers and sellers have likely left orders, it is much easier to read the language of price and trade the markets. Market structure, energy coils, the gap, that spike high that was resistance then became support, another energy coil, projected forward these beautiful multi-pivot lines, or simple trend lines with multiple touches if you want to think of them that way. It just marks out where the whales or the big buyers are going to leave their limit buy orders. When price comes back down there, you know you've got friends. Lean on them. If you can identify that, it makes it much easier. At this area, you can assume, at least for the first time up, the boys that have been getting, I should say boys and girls, that have, were waiting patiently with large size are probably going to start unloading a significant portion of their portfolio. It's time to take some profits. doesn't mean they have to get short. doesn't even mean they have to get rid of everything, but they're going to lighten up. This is a good area for you to think about taking some profits. Don't be greedy. So let me see. I think that's it. Let me. Yep. So thank you for all taking. You've taken a lot of time out of your day. I appreciate it. And it's a beautiful spring day or summer day, I guess. I guess we're in June. It's summer already. Time is flying. Uh, we're, we're coming toward the Mayan end of the world um, quickly. Um, Cynthia is about to ask. We're, Cynthia is about to do her thing. Before you start, to Cynthia, wait. Let me get this in because I never get a chance to do this. She's going to do a poll in a second. Do me a favor. When she does her poll, don't forget, there's an area where you can add uh, quote comments. If you put webcast or webinar or anything like that in the comment section, it reflects positively on Cynthia. Forget about me. Cynthia. And the reason why is because It'll help Cynthia continue to provide quality education. And Cynthia, I'll have to tell you, um, there is nobody. I, I, there's the two tag team people that I love to partner with are Cynthia and Barbara. I, I, Barbara had to leave because she has lots of things to do with the CME. But I love part partnering with both of them because it's nothing but quality education. None of us are here to sell anything. We're not. We're not pushing uh, IB products. We're just here to just do quality education. We're not pushing market geometry. It, we just hope that you come here, learn some things, ask some questions, and walk away with some knowledge. So if you get a chance, either when you send emails to, to uh, IB on their feedback uh, to say, uh, love webcab, webcasts, like to see more of, them, more of them or webinars, or um, on the poll here, if you get a chance, if you see the box, put in webinar or webcast or freight Cynthia. It's just good for her. That's just that's just my thank you to her. So anyway, Cynthia, I'll turn it over well, to you with another question. Well, thank you so much, Kim. And what I have been doing, and my apologies, I did have to filter out a lot of those chats. So I am going to run a poll, but for Kim, um, you only need to scroll up a few um, uh, inches there it. to see yep. the ones that I've sent you. I've been trying to filter out a lot of the noise that we can't understand. Uh, so if you take a look at the chats, I'm also going to open up a poll that Tim was just mentioning. Um, now, <clears throat> this management does require, and I thank Tim. This is why I love working with Tim as well. Uh -huh. um, but you'll see that there are just a few questions there, and I do review it with management on a weekly basis. So if you can let me know your feedback, and there's comments or questions or uh, comments section uh, number two where you can enter information. Now, also, this poll is only open for about 30 seconds, so I ask that you make your selections and then click the submit button down at the very bottom of the screen. That will allow us to compile the information. Now, if it does end too quickly for you, you can always send me comments or suggestions or other topics you'd like to hear more about at webinars at interactivebrokers.com. 
Uh, uh, excellent. So thanks, everyone. Poll did end. Now you can all remove that from the screen. And what I am going to do is um, actually turn this back over to Tim. I saw a lot of questions, and those that we can understand and respond to are going to be in the chat panel. So um, if you would yeah, I, enter any uh, additional questions at this point. Back to you, Tim. I, I lost. I lost my. I lost my question. What did I? Oh, double-click the chat panel title bar. Um, Everyone, you can uh, close out of that polling panel oh, using it. the X. And um, and Tim, you should only have to uh, scroll up just a very short way. A lot of. Uh, Comments are coming in. Thank you so much. Another great session. Love this kind of webcast. Tim is great. Thanks for having him as a presenter. Those I'm not going to be passing through. You'll be able to see them later on. But any questions, would you please enter them into the chat panel right yep. now? Okay. Let's see. Uh, what do I mean by multi-pivot? I already answered. Somebody asked me how much, this was earlier, just doing a couple off the top of my head before we started to filter some stuff out, um, how many pips above or below structure. Um, I, used to, I like to go at least, um, I like five ticks or better, but not, no more than eight on this type of trade um, because, you're not, you know, so many times you're going to get your eight ticks and they get stopped out of break even. So um, you don't want to risk too much on this, otherwise the risk reward just gets too inverted. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, there you go. Greg Holman, how, how far would you like to be below structure? If it's significant structure, two, three ticks is fine. Um, it's got to go below the magenta lines at some point. We're talking about the multi-pivot lines. It doesn't have to do anything, and it can, it, the market's going to do what it's going to do. And in this case, it basically tipped it, but, uh, you know, ticked it, but never really uh, broke it. So. Uh, what are clues that might break down below mag the magenta line? Um, I would say if you if you fail to make prior structure up above, if we had fa failed to take out the prior highs and we're coming down. Um, um, the opposite of what you think. I think most of you think that if it came down extremely hard and vertical, it was, would be likely to break. But instead, actually, what I what I fear the most, if I'm thinking that the magenta line is going to hold, is if it, if it comes down in an orderly fashion, that, that means cascades gently. Let me move back. I think I still have the cursor going. Yeah. If we just cascaded lower here, um, that would that would bother me the most. But because we continued to take out highs and made new highs and then turned lower. I'm not particularly worried. If we had just came to this area and then the next move up only came here and then we were heading lower, I'd be worried. But we made significant highs. Now we're pulling back the balance. So I'm not particularly worried about um, in any way that this is not going to hold. I do need to see buyers. And what shows me buyers? Look at price. My bars as we get closer down here, volatility slows down and we get a nice clump of bars where you know price the bars are smaller and uh, and price slows down I mean while I drink some water here um, as you are reassessing the second corner trade slides 50 51 where would you be keeping same a point or would you use the prior C point as the new a uh, okay hang on Oh, I see what you're saying. This is, well, okay, 50-51. This would not actually be a corner trade. You could you could set it up as a corner trade, and I would use this low, this high, this low. I use this as a pure structure trade, uh, and this was, Brian, um, I use this as a pure structure trade off of, I knew that there were significant buyers here, and once I saw that they, they're trying to push it through the buyers and are unable to, you can see here we have one poke that's just the tick below the second magenta line. When they start to head up higher as we come back lower, I'm getting long right in that area. And, of course, then we 
we get some wide bars higher. But you could certainly have set that up as a corner trade. I just didn't. This low, this high, this low. I wouldn't bother to do anything. You could do this. It looks a little flat to me. But uh, in that case, if you do this, you're really just using the structure uh, same as the mountain. Nothing wrong with that either. I just I like the lowest low if possible. Um, let's see. Barry, how are you? Um, this strategy can be applied to other markets. Well, this strategy certainly should and could be applied to all, anything that fluctuates. Anything. And you know, my fifth graders use it on stocks, long only, and have a wonderful uh, rate of return. Um, that's the fourth year I've done this with them, and uh, they they're, they they get better every year, and they're different kids every year, but. Um, I actually only use corner trades as I diagram them out today in the bonds and notes. I'm sorry I didn't have a note trade for you, um, but I only show you real trades, and it just happened to be that I was using uh, uh, bond trades. It, well, it's, it was what I was focusing on. I personally like the bonds better because the ticks are twice the size of the notes, and the, their actual excursion, their swing size, is larger than the notes. If you have a smaller account, you would probably favor the notes because the tick size is one half, so the stops will be smaller. One of the nice things I like about the CME and the CBOT is that they have a product to fit every account size. Um, you just need to go through the different instruments that they offer and pick pick the instrument uh, that fits what your tr you know what your account balance is and how you're trying to trade. Uh, you can answer this after present. Oh, okay. Uh, there's a smaller energy coil just to the left of the one used in the C pivot. Okay, let's go. Let's go. It's four, page 41. Let's go take a look. Okay. Right here. Uh, I think. Smaller energy coil to the left of the one they used for the C pivot. A, B, C. Yeah, right here. Why didn't you use that one for the corner trade? Uh, could have. Just didn't. Um, would have been, let's see. Uh, well, there's one problem. It's an eight-tick stop. Might, might have waved me off. Um, actually, it's more than eight if, you, if, you, if you're talking about this clump here because your stop's going to have to be underneath the magenta lines, you'd be further than eight ticks. So that would wave me off of it. And I use stops as one of my filters. I don't, on corner trades, that's all I'm willing to risk. Um, let's see. If the gap closed, then it becomes very good resistance support, holds this position. Actually, fascinating, um, fascinating thought, however, We've done a lot of we've done a lot of work on gaps, a lot of statistical work. And by statistical work, I don't mean look at 10 or 100 or remember that this happened and X happened. Because as humans, we tend to remember what we want to remember. But when we do statistics, we start with 10,000 and we'll often go as high as millions. We use all kinds of markets, all kinds of time frames to try and generate as many data, ser data series that meet the setups as possible. And what we find is that it doesn't matter if a gap gets filled or not. That's basically noise. And the thought that um, I remember being on the floor, um, everybody would gun for filling, that means make a run at filling gaps. And so people thought that there was always this propensity that gaps would be filled or not filled. And if it was filled, it was this. Or if it wasn't filled, it was that. The truth is it's really pretty much about noise. Um, but the key for the gap, let's see if it shows up on, fifth, on the prior slide. Yeah. The key here is much more, to be honest with you, even though, okay, this is, gaps have two pivots. They have the lower, the higher, and the lower part of the open gap are both pivots. You can even use the center when you draw, according to Dr. Andrews. The key to this is this tight energy coil right here is the golden nugget. This one, 
and this one, and that they're not violated. And you can see people pushing, 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 trying to violate these laws. And then we come and fill the gap. And then they think they're going to go lower. And they push and push and push. And here's the multi-pivot line. Someone asked earlier, what's the multi-pivot line? Look at, the, look at them trying to get below here. Push, 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 push. The whale steps out of the way for a minute or two. And we get one low that spikes just a little bit lower. And then he steps right back in and buys more bonds. When he steps out of the way, by the way, it probably allows him to buy an extra 10,000 bonds. Then price jerks back up when they realize he's still buying. To make one push lower, it takes off. This is what makes this trade. This energy coil and this energy coil. The gap is nice, but whether it's filled or not is, is not particularly important. It set up an earlier corner trade nicely, and it did show that the intention was to move this market higher for a period of time, but we're really set it up for these tight energy coils. If you pay attention to these, there's some beautiful trades that we did, one off of here, one off of here, more, and then again, a beautiful trade, which was just based on the projection of these energy coils over here that turned out to be an absolutely gorgeous trade. And this you can apply to any market. If you see these types of energy coils and project them out and wait for price, I know when you're up here, in, your, in the back of your mind you think, there is no way I will ever see this price again. And you need to beat that out of yourself and just say, ah, you know what? Now, there, now, remember, there are lots of trades in here. You could have made lots of money doing different trades in here. However, if you're taking the longer, longer term perspective and looking for high probability trades, in the back of your mind, you should be thinking, when they're up here, instead of having the defeatist mentality of it'll never get back down there, you should be thinking, when price gets back down here, I think I know what will happen, and I'm ready to act. Now, if it breaks through to the downside, which Ann asked about, that's fine. You can sell against them. They've become resistance at that point. The sellers weren't there, and there'll be a lot of people that are caught long that will have to unload, so you can then use this as a sell zone. But as long as this area holds, this is where the whales are at. This is where the big buyers are at. Let me see if I can read on down further. Um, if the gap doesn't, then become very, oh, can we do that one? Um, does any candle analysis come into this, or does it boil down to using median lines? Well, I don't use candlesticks, as you can tell. I use, um, they just clutter up my charts. I know candlesticks in and out. I know Steve very, Steve Neeson very well, um, and have since he first did his original work. And, of course, he's retired at this point, doesn't do um, anything live anymore. But um, I just like to read price action. If you will, I, I'm a, I read the ticker. Um, in the old days, people would sit around at their stockbroker and just watch price come along on the board, and uh, they would read price based on the latest up or down tick. And I can do that uh, all day long, just watching price unfold and on uh, price bars. I just like black price bars, simple price bars. And so I don't use candles. If candles help you, go ahead. But in terms of the named, uh, you know, like, you know, Hang, you know, hanging star and all that. I don't do all of that stuff. And to me, it just, it's just, it, it, it's extra, extra stuff. Just like squiggly lines. I don't have any squiggly lines. Um, and it's not just median line analysis. As you can see, this last trade was purely based on market structure. So um, I start out with market structure and the market flow and the likely areas where price is going to find buyers. And from there, I use various tools, including you know, my main tool after that would be median lines and action reaction lines to help me uh, frame my trades. Uh, John asks, with large limit orders, do you get a lot of slippage that will eat into your profit? Well, John, you know, actually the bonds, I, I, I said this at the beginning, I can turn 10, 20, 30,000 bonds with no slippage, period. And the nice thing about the CBOT is there's so much movement through the market when we get down to these active areas like this, you can be on the bid for 30,000 bonds and get filled at your price. You don't have to go to the market and buy them. You can be on the bid and get filled. It's not that hard. So, you know, if you're trading, uh, you know, a 10 lot, a 100 lot, a 1,000 lot in the bonds, that's nothing. It's meaningless. 
Uh, there's no slippage at all. Oh my God. Scotty McClendon is here. He was one of my greatest friends. Scotty McClendon, a good old friend, and did a lot of help at Market Geometry doing presentations. I hope everything's well, my friend. It's great to see you. Um, there's also a couple uh, friends here that uh, studied under Dr. Andrews that uh, come regularly to Cynthia's uh, presentations here, and uh, always great to see uh, the two of you. So, hi, Scotty. How you doing? Um, did you only corner? Tra did you only trade the corner trade during certain times of the day? Ah, it, I used to, Eric when I first began to do the analysis. Here's how the corner trade started. Um, I've always been a big, 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 big hitter in foreign currencies, biggest in the world, one of the top three or four in my in my time period. Meaning, uh, you know, the New York hours. Billions and billions and billions, and these days, 10, 20, 30, 40 billion dollars um, on big positions. The problem was bonds open at 720, and uh, in 1999 through about 2001, I was trading a lot of E mini S&Ps and NASDAQ futures because that's what was hot in, uh, you know. That's what was really rocking and rolling. If, to give you an example, these days, you're lucky in the NASDAQ futures if you get 30 points in a day. In 1999 through 2001, the profit target on a normal day would be 200 NASDAQ points, and we'd often get 200 in the morning and hit our profit target, and 200 in the afternoon and hit our profit target. It was really wild and woolly. But that didn't open until 8.30, so the bonds were open at 7.20. Currencies were kind of dead at that period until after the S&Ps and the NASDAQs opened. Currencies were just kind of dead. So I had a quandary. I could either sleep in late or find something else to trade. So I went through uh, a lot of different things and brought it down to the bond market, and then I spent 18 months doing analysis looking for a particular type of trade that I could trade on a regular balance, something that I saw repeatable, um, that would give me a high probability that would last basically until um, stock index futures. And I tended to wait till they were open about an hour before I traded. So I'd have until about 7.20 in the morning Chicago time until about 9.30 Chicago time, so about two hours to trade. And that's, uh, that's where I developed them. And for the longest time, I only took corner trades during those hours. But we found over time, especially in the last three or four years, that corner trades now in the bonds. The bonds are so active and there's so much going on because of the political turmoil and other um, interest rate actions from other countries around the world that the bond market's active 24 hours now. So, you know, coils, tight energy coils appear all the time. Corner trades are available all the time. So I trade them whenever I see them and I, whenever I'm in front of the screen and know I have the time uh, to pay attention and trade them. So. Since you typically get less ticks per trade, did you trade more dollars per trade? No, I use, I actually use equivalent risk, Eric. So um, the key is not to make, uh, what's the right way to say it? To make a killing on each trade. The key is to take your piece out each time. At the end of the month, that adds up to a lot of money. But you see on these trades, um, eight, I'm only taking eight ticks on the first half, but on some of the second halves, I'm taking out a point, point and a half. It really doesn't matter. You need me, Cynthia? Okay? Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry, Tim. No, go ahead. All right. Just take, making sure. Um, uh, notes versus bond thoughts. So I, I went there briefly. Um, again, I like bonds versus notes because I like the big tick, meaning I'm getting $31.25 per tick uh, for my brokerage. Um, Notes are one half that. If you have a smaller account, you probably like notes. The other thing is the average excursion or wave, the actual movement here, we actually get about 47% more or larger move in the bonds than we do in the notes over the same movement. So I like that. You might not like that. Um, 
especially the size of the stop if you have a smaller account. So those are my thoughts. Either one is fine. They're both wonderful to trade. They're extremely liquid, and they move beautifully throughout the day, and, and even these days, 24 hours. Um, Greg Holman says, profit on taking, uh, thoughts on taking profit on quartiles versus initial eight ticks and at one tick ahead of median line. I have no problem about taking uh, not even one tick, but sometimes 90% in front of the median line. You know, you're getting close to your profit target. A lot of times I'll put my order in front. I have no problem with that. Greg, quartiles are useless, statistically, just so you know. Um, that, that means, uh, let me go to a median line. Here's, here's a quartile. If you bisected the lower parallel and the median line here, you'll see some charting programs have like the 0 0.382, the 618, the 1 half, et cetera, et cetera, and divides us up 15 ways from Sunday. But if you actually do the statistics, quartiles are, they're, rel they're relatively meaningless. You're better off drawing in a sliding parallel from a prior area of support or resistance and using that than you are just using quartiles, uh, in my opinion. All right. Um, let me move up here so I, I don't get too lost. Getting a lot of nice questions they sent here. Just give me a second here. Tim, while you're looking for yes, those I'm questions, I've had... I lost you. Oh, uh, I've had several questions come in about the slides and about the recording, and I do want everyone to know you'll be getting links from me later on this afternoon, a direct link to the playback, but also there's a link to our archived webinars. If you check underneath the Industry Sponsored tab, you can filter for Tim Morge, and you'll see the notes. There's a link to the notes that are included right next to our recording link. So access to both the recording and the slides will be coming your way soon after today's event ends. Alrighty. John asks, um, hi John, how are you? Do the patterns look as good with standard price and time, meaning he's talking about 15 minutes or 20 minutes, versus tick based charts, um, if you ignore the out of hour action? And does the setup work equally well on different time, scales, time frames? Absolutely. They look the same. Um, all you have to do is remember that if you're using time-based charts, that you'll have some dead space. Um, you might even consider using day-only charts. They'll leave some gaps, but it'll take out that dead space if it bothers you. But um, it, they work equally well. You know, they work well on dailies. They even work on monthlies. You just have to wait a long time for trades. But then again, the volatility will give you uh, some magnificent profits. So don't worry about that. Which works better, pitchforks or multi-supports? Um, TJ, they're they're equal. Um, you know, you can think of this line here. Here, let me move back one chart. Let me back to go to a traditional median line. Here. Hang on a second. There we go. The nice thing about a median line. Let's frame it up for you. When you draw in A, B, and C. It has mathematics built into it, and you know and there are statistics that have been done. In fact, three doctoral dissertations, as well as all the work that I've done, and you know with 80% probability that price, once it starts to take out highs, is going to make the median line. It's one of the few leading, true leading indicators there are in the world. Period. Those squiggly lines that you see on the bottom of people's charts, they lag the market by quite a bit. But this is a leading indicator. It has a mathematical probability the moment you can identify the C pivot. Now, multi-pivot line, it's a simple trend line, if you will. At some point, you can draw it probably right around here. It's just as interesting, and the nice thing about it is you know that there's all kinds of people in the world looking at this area. Whales are going to be buying here. You might even get retail people buying here. And if this breaks, by the way, if this becomes a failure, it'll give you a huge move to the downside. So which tool is better? Well, this is a market structure tool, and median lines are a leading indicator tool. They're both extremely important and both very valuable. I wouldn't want to take either one out of my portfolio, and um, I use them both. They're use them both. Learn how to use them and, and go at it. 
Next question, TJ. Let's see. Um, is there a reason why I limit it to notes and bonds? Yes. Um, I actually don't see the statistical validity for corner trades. I have lots of students, I have a lot of, lots of members at Market Geometry that point out corner trades um, in, for example, foreign exchange. However, if, when I do the work, the reason why corner trades work is because the, pro, the percent winning percentage is so high. Do, the corner trades work pretty well on other things, but we're, we're talking about 55%, not 75 or 80%. So the, 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 at, when you get down to 55%, if you only take out eight ticks here and then get profit stopped out or get pro, stopped out of break even here, the trade, the money management doesn't hold up. Now, if you set it up instead as a tight coil and multi-pivot line trade, and you're not taking half your profit off, and you're letting your profits run, now the risk reward works for you on the multi-pivot line. And that's why I only use the corner trades on bonds and notes. But I will use the same setup, if you will, this energy coil setup, off of a multi-pivot line and get let my profits run and just hide my stops underneath as price moves higher and I'll get significant profits. But again, well, at that point, we'll be talking about 55 to 60% profitable, not 75 to 80, and that's why you have to manage it differently. And your risk reward does have to be three or four or five to one on each trade. Otherwise, you won't like the outcome long term. Um, I answered that one. Could you mention what time you normally trade these bonds again? Um, I love to trade them again between 7.20 Chicago time and 9. But uh, these days, in the last three or four years, the interest rate markets around the world have become so interesting that you can take bond trades. And you can do this in bonds, by the way. I just don't. But you can trade uh, you know, bonds anytime you see this formation. And I do. Um. Um, how did you filter out the Hagopian when you took the short trade on the upper median line for your first example, or the second example? I didn't filter it out. What I said was, um, you know, it's one of the things that concerns me, but everything else lines up well enough, and I've already had a winning trade, so I'd be giving back half my profits. You know, there's enough going for, for me that I'm willing to take this trade in the flow of the market. Um, I like the flow of the market. So I didn't like the Hagopian but I liked everything else about the trade, and that's why I was willing to take the trade. So one thing I didn't like was the Hagopian. Again, if you're looking for five things and you get four or three or four are out of the five, you have to you know, weigh it and decide whether or not some days I might decide the Hagopian is too much for me and I might not take the trade, but on that particular day, um, I took the trade. There's a, there's a little bit of art in this. There's no doubt about it. What considerations do you have when you execute the corner trade on FX? I don't execute, um, Georgie, I don't execute uh, corner trades in FX markets ever. But instead, it doesn't mean I won't use the tight energy coils. Okay, here's how I, here's how I would execute it. If this was, let's move forward. If I was watching this market come down in the foreign currencies, I'd be getting long in this area with a stop underneath this poke right here. And it would be a market structure based off of this energy coil and this energy coil and these multi-pivot lines with a stop underneath the prior last low. And I would be looking to get out right before we got up to these highs, so probably right around here. And that's exactly how we would trade this in cash foreign exchange or currency futures, Georgie. How are you doing, Georgie, by the way? Uh, where can you find the average tick number of that instrument? Um, I actually just go through the bars and add them up. I have an Excel spreadsheet that keeps it for me. Um, I'm trying
kind of think if you know, certainly there, certainly there are ensign routines that are pre-written. There are trade station routines that are pre-written. I'm sure you could find somebody to write it in Metastock or MetaTrader, excuse me. Um, but I don't know that the CME or anybody keeps a, uh, a database that tells you the exact number of ticks in a day. Does time in a coil cause you concern as it is possibly breaking the other way? No. The longer, it's, Greg, the longer it stays in a coil, the more energy it's got. So let it stay. It's fine with me. I don't really care. It'll, it, it, there's no, you have no ability. I, I know people think they have the ability to know which way it's going to break out of a coil, but actually, uh, it's, it's statistically speaking, it'll break out where it breaks out. Now, in this case, you had large buyers underneath these two coils. Certainly, once the second, first coil had formed, you had a clue that there were large buyers underneath. Um, so at that point, you have a predilection to being long. But you know, if you were just in midair and you had a coil, I don't see one on here, but let's say we didn't have buyers over here. Um, if there was a coil forming right here, statistically speaking, it's about equal which way it's going to break out. So what you do is you wait for it to break out, then you find a way in, whether it's a retest of the coil to, to get long or a retest on the downside to get short. Um, when we use a normal pitchfork, one shift and one modified shift. I actually don't use the shift very often. Uh, Jeremy Schiff presented that uh, dissertation to Dr. Andrews in 1972. I actually was there at the time. Um, and then Dr. Andrews looked at it and several months later came back and said, look, we should modify it and move Jeremy Schiff's original. The, the shift is just up 50%. Andrews looked at it for two months with statistics and, says, and said it should be up 50% and over 50%. That's the difference between the two. I tend to use the modified shift 95% of the time. The shift very seldom. Um, the, when do I use them? I love modified shifts in currencies. For some reason, they work really well in currencies in almost every situation. But any time that we have a near vertical situation like this, my first thought is I put in the median line and then I take a look at it and then I'll take a look at the modified shift and see which I like better. Uh, let's see now. Is this clumping pattern corner trade you observed specifically bond related? No, we've already answered. Yeah, bond related. But that you can, again, you can use the energy coil and put stops underneath it, especially if there's an area to the left in foreign currencies and get the same type of action. But I wouldn't use I wouldn't use a corner trade. And the corner trade, remember, part of it is taking profits eight ticks above. You'd have to relate that to foreign to foreign exchange. Doing that really waters down your risk reward and will make the trade not work very well for you. Um, do you always use a fourteen forty four tick chart? Nope. Use three fifty twos 722s, you know, the number really doesn't matter. 1399s, 2755s, it doesn't really matter. I use something as long as it's flowing nicely. You know, some days you'll look at the 1444 and say, you know what, this is too many ticks. It's too, it, it's not giving me enough uh, uh, pivots, if you will, so I'll go down to a 352. Maybe that's too fast, so it looks kind of blocky. So then I'll go to something in between, so 700 and something, 722 and then it'll look like it flows. So there's nothing magic about the numbers. Um, oh, do you need to have an interest, uh, understanding of, well, here's a great question from David. Do you need to have an understanding of interest rates to trade bonds or pure price action swing structure? I, you just need price action. Because I'll give you an example. If you've ever traded copper or cotton or cocoa or any of those other things, uh, are you a copper co or cocoa or cotton expert? Probably not. When we do uh, live analysis on market geometry, most of, and and my and my partner Shane is putting charts up. Most of the time, I have I don't even pay attention to what's over here on the left hand corner that says you know bonds or cocoa or whatever. And half the time, I'll be saying, well, the euro's making a new low. And he'll say, no, no, we've, we've moved on to Swiss, Tim. And I'll go, oh, yeah, sorry about that. I just look at pure price action. It's meaningless. You don't have to know anything about interest rates. Um, 
Which is more robust, Andrews Pitchfork or Multi-Support? No, I, you, you, uh, you've asked, asked me to wrestle that down before, and uh, it, it depends on the application. They're both they're useful in, in uh, different situations. Um, one is market structure, and one is a leading indicator. They're both extremely useful, and uh, and I, I can't I can't choose between the two, and I wouldn't take either one of them out of my portfolio. Um, hang on, I lost myself there. There we go. Um, do the patterns look as good? Yes, I already did that one. Um, do I look at bid ask uh, order flow? under the assumption that order flow precedes price? Uh, Scott, it's a good question. The honest to God truth is, uh, no offense to the CME and the CBOT, they use what's called um, volume facilitation, which means they try and get everybody involved, so they, they want the one lot traders to be equal to the, it's not first in, first out like everybody thinks it is. They want the one lot traders to be equal to the 10,000 lot traders. and so. 10,000 and 30,000 lot traders have built into their programs. Um, if they want to buy a 20, let's say 24,000 bonds, they put in that they need to buy 32,333 on average to get filled for 24,000 based on that uh, program. And so, the, the the bids and asks that you see are, are are really not representative of the true market because their programs know that when they get close to getting filled on their 24,000 bonds, it pulls their balance. So. I, I don't pay at all. It's called Dome, for those of you who wonder, to show you the 5 or 10, depending on what you pay for. 5 or 10 best bids or offers, I don't pay any attention to that. means nothing to me. Absolutely nothing. Neither does the volume traded. That's all useless. Um, let's see. Come to Mongolia. Hey, I'd love to. Absolutely. Uh, Dean, some traders use floor trader pivots as a reference point. Do you use them or take them into account? Well, Dean, here's the thing. What did Barbara say at the beginning? More than 95%, I think she said 90, but it's higher than that. More than 95% of the trading going on in the bonds is done electronically. Floor pivots used to be extremely important in the 80s and some things in the 70s. They used to be, and I don't mean to disparage it's not a female thing or a male thing, but there used to be these older women that would walk around the pits and sell pivot sheets and Fibonacci sheets for 20 bucks a day. And, you know, two-thirds of, of each pit would be standing there holding the same colored sheet. So it became self-fulfilling. But those people no longer rule the trading. The, the days of floor pivots, uh, they're gone. Sorry. And, and one of my friends, I know that's his basis of, uh, you know, making his – his living as an educator, that's fine, but uh, it's, it doesn't hold the usefulness that it used to because the pit traders aren't there anymore. Um, bonds, buns, those are all traded electronically. Foreign exchange, three, four, five trillion dollars trade in the cash market. There's a lot to trade in the CME, but there's almost none, almost none trade in the pit. Most of it's electronic, and even what is traded uh, at the CME is small compared to cash. So. Floor pivots, no, they ain't happening anymore, sorry. Um, some coils produce a large move, some do not. Um, which property of the coil decides the magnitude of the move? Unfortunately, you cannot, uh, who was this from? This is Max Speed. Hi, Max. Um, unfortunately, you know, there was a rumor that Dr. Andrews had a measuring device, and the truth is you can't tell what a coil is going to produce. Sometimes you'll get these big, beautiful, wonderful moves out of a coil as we did here. Sometimes you'll get a move out and then a bust right back through the other end when a failure and then move down to this side. Sometimes you get a move out and then you just get more congestion. You don't know what you're going to get. Um, that's why you have to use stops. That's why you have to pay attention to market structure. And that's why you have to have a plan that includes both, both entries and exits. You don't know what you're going to get. There's no way to tell. Um, I wish there was. Um, what other markets does this work on? Well, energy coils will work on any market. This sort of looking at what tightly packed ranges here and here. And also the gap work, which are in the prior two sessions. Go back and just look at the prior two sessions. Um, I only apply corner trades to bonds and notes. You could certainly apply them to bonds. 
or if you trade any other interest rate, longer-term interest rate markets around the world. But uh, I would not apply them the way I applied them here to currencies or copper or those types of things. How do I determine the starting point of the median line? Well, I, I didn't do anything magic, did I? I just picked a major low, period. End of discussion. The only odd thing was, take, let's take a look. Again, modified shift. Here's the A. To make it a modified shift, here's the B. We draw a line here. We go halfway between A and B. We move it up halfway. Then we find the center of BC. We draw a vertical line. We move it halfway between the vertical line of A and this vertical line. So we'll go up halfway, up over halfway. That gives us our A for a modified shift. There it is. So traditional median line, major low. Same BC. Modified shift, we just moved it up 50%, over 50%. That channels the slope. And when we get this kind of vertical move, we tend to find that that gives us a better probable path of pricing. It's more likely to present, project it forward, which is what we're trying to do. Um, have you found this type of trade to work in currencies as well? No. Using the energy coil with a stop below will work beautifully in the currencies or anything else. But not a corner trade per se. Okay? What are your other favorite setups? Retest, test and retest, yeah. Number one trade that I use. Um, and zoom and retest, yep, I use zoom and retest, retest as well. Absolutely. And then these tight energy coils that have a nice stop underneath, this makes my mouth water. So, great question now. Um, William, does price clumping tend to occur more at point C is more than A or B. Well, um, you're putting the horse after the cart, so to speak. Um, because this price is clumping after this B and A, that makes us draw in the C. So that that's, that's just a question of how we draw things and more than anything else. Um, in your opinion, does corner trades also work for Eurobond, for Bunds? Absolutely. I just don't like to trade in the middle of the night. But, yeah, Bunds rock and roll, no doubt about it. Um, in general, and they work with corner trades just fine. In general, do trades originating from energy coils last shorter due to explosive moves and also has less structure to hide stops under? Uh, no, you have beautiful, hey, Ouija, you have beautiful, how you doing? You have beautiful structure to hide under. Um, they, they do tend to be explosive when they work well, so they may not last as long, although you saw on this trade, take a look here, I got in and then well, it kind of died for a period of time. So sometimes they explode and sometimes it takes a while for the fuse to light. Um, Oh, here's a big mistake Max Speed does. This is a big mistake, Max. Does energy coils reveal anything if we dissect it to lower time frames or ticks? But pay attention to me very closely, folks. And I, I've got three PhDs. Another gentleman who uses his name, puts doctor in front of his name. I don't like the honorifics. I'm not interested in that stuff. Um, came out with a theory that, show, that showed how important multiple time frames are. And that's how he built his career. And um, this is junk, because, in my opinion, because, and no offense to him, because if you look, if you if you normally trade 20 minutes, and then before you get ready to take your trade, you always jump to the 240s to to decide whether or not to take your trade. You're going to talk yourself in or out of lots of 20 minute trades, um, and you're just going to confuse yourself. Likewise, if you go down in time frame, you're going to confuse yourself. The volatility is different down there. If it's going to trade, if it's going to change, it's going to change. I would pick one time frame and stay with it. I wouldn't do any analysis on any lower or higher time frame. You're just going to confuse yourself. Going down and looking at the coil at a lower time frame, it's meaningless. Um, any any other tips on identifying point C, the key to the fork? Um, well, if you're willing to wait for it, Draw in what you think is point C, and then watch it take out 
if you're uh, if it's an upsloping one, watch it take out some highs, and then you can buy. This is a test and retest right here. You can then buy as it comes back down to the lower parallel. So that's about the only tip I can give you. Otherwise, we call that the hunt for the C pivot. We talk about that a lot of market geometry. Um, the key really is you should be paying attention to the support and be saying, you know what? It's likely that the C pivot, if it's going to form, is going to form along this magenta line, and then wait for price to intersect. And sure enough, it does. I, and Cynthia, I think we're running out of questions. Well, actually, one more just came in, so uh -oh. hold tight, Tim. <clears throat> okay. I'm good to the end, so keep going. You're okay. typing these? My God, you can. You need overtime. <laughs> I'm copying and pasting. That works. Same, okay. same thing. Now That's a lot working. of work. All God right, bless you. Okay. See why I love Cynthia? Okay. What's the minimum account size you would have to properly trade futures? In the case of T-bonds, 15K or 20, so you can trade at least three or four contracts? No, I would just trade one contract, Dean. I feel trading a futures account at, with 2 or 5K on, say, the E-minis would leave you undercapitalized. I would absolutely agree with that. What's your opinion? By the way, thanks for the seven. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, people ask me, I, you know, I know there are brokers out there. I'm, I'm not going to ask Cynthia what they were ask it. I'd be, it's meaningless to me, but that'll let you trade uh, an E-mini for $500. I think that's ludicrous. If you have a, uh, that, so if you have a $10,000 account, you could trade uh, whatever that it turns out to be. That, you know, you should be trading one. And same thing here. If you're trading corner, corner trades in the bonds with a $10,000 account, trade one bond, one. Work your, you, you need to earn size, we call that. When your account, when you're consistently profitable for a number of months, a number of uh, months, and your account size begins to grow, at that point, then I would think about upping my size. But trade one and earn size. Um, and that's a, that's a good one to end on, Dean. Don't over uh, extend your leverage. Um, I know people take a look at the minimum amount that they have to put up, and that's what they tend to put up. And uh, I, what I would tell you is under leverage, under leverage, under leverage, because you want to be in the game longer and longer and longer and learn how to trade. Does that make sense? Does that work, Cynthia? Ah, uh, tremendous, Tim. Thank you so much. Now, also, what I would like to do, because I've had several other questions that came in about the notes and previous webinars. So I'm going to notice everyone, your screen is going to blank momentarily. I want to take you to the Interactive Brokers website. Ah. Simply go to interactivebrokers.com. Underneath the education menu, you'll find our webinars listing. Now on here, uh, notice there's a link to live webinars. We do this with Tim, and he's been so kind to um, agree to come back every month second Tuesday of every month, Tim will be doing a webinar. We normally have it posted by the first of the month, so do watch our live webinars page. But also, as Tim mentioned, we've been doing this for a while, so I do want you to see that if we go into the recorded webinars, we actually have several different tabs, but under the Industry Sponsored tab, this has actually been sponsored by the CME. Now you can filter for all CME events, but I also want you to see that you can filter by speaker. And if we come in here, we'll, you can easily find Tim Morge and notice all of his events will be displayed. The direct link to the recorded playback is available, but notice as well, there's a direct link to the notes. So if you want to review any of our previous sessions this, um, this year or, um, or simply pull up the notes, if you haven't been able to pull them up after each event, notice that they're also available here. So our next event is coming up, and it will be July 12th. So I want to thank, um, so be on the lookout for that, everyone. I better start yeah. working, huh? <laughs> oh, time to start looking at other trades, now, oh um, or other setups. Now, we also do, and what I'm going to do here is actually move back to my previous um, <clears throat> topic, because underneath our live webinars, there's also an industry-sponsored tab. So if you want to take a quick or a sneak peek at what the topic is that Tim will be discussing, notice here, there's, uh, I do have the CME School of Futures. Last month, we were taking a look at bonds, and this, um, and coming up in a couple of weeks, 
we'll be taking a look at the energy market. So that will be Tim's topic for next month for the July 12th event. So please do uh, join us for that by registering for any of the events. Whether you can attend live or not, you'll automatically receive a direct link to Tim's recorded playback. So I want to thank all of you. Let's go back into uh, our event window right now, and I want to thank everyone. We've been at this for a while today, and we all appreciate the time that you've spent with us. And especially, I want to thank Tim Morge for all the work he's put into this and graciously now has been able to answer all of the questions. But also, I do want to thank the CME group uh, because it's their dedication to education that's made today's event possible. So with that, we are going to go ahead and end today's session. Um, and you can all exit using the X in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. If you want to come back and review any of the concepts Tim discussed today, simply watch your email for a direct link to the recorded playback um, that will be delivered to your mail box uh, very soon. Also, in that email, you'll find that there is a link to the archived webinar section. Just remember to look under the Industry Sponsors tab. So thank you all for your participation here today. We do appreciate the time that you spent. And thank you as well, Tim. Um, take care of that voice. Uh, we're looking for more interesting information coming up next month. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, it was great to see Barbara from the CME. I appreciate the, the education that the CME always offers. And uh, anytime you are willing to have me, you, Cynthia, you know I'll be here. Um, and we'll, we'll try and do something interesting. Next month we'll be doing energies. And I appreciate all the time and energy you put into it. And uh, I love that it's just education oriented. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Well, I can't wait for July, so thanks, everyone. Remember, you can exit using the X in the upper right-hand corner. Have a great day, everyone, and do remember to trade smart. Thanks. Take care, everybody.